So I finally gotten my camera to work. I hope I hope I hope it works. Let's, let's see. Is it working? Yeah, I think so. So I guess I shall be checking time to time with this. Um feedback that I'm seeing on the screen to see if my camera is working. And um so hi and hello and welcome to Hospital Survival Guide. This is a new series on my channel where I give you tips on how to survive medical school, tips of how to survive school when you've graduated as a newly graduated doctor. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Also follow us on Facebook at Dr. MK7 and let's dive in. So I'm sure most of you have been in such a situation where you're thinking, do I really belong to this group of individuals? Do I belong to this place? What am I doing here? Um, is there anything that's here for me? Um, am I in the right course? So here are the five things that I wish I knew before getting into the clinical clerkship. Now, this is pretty much for those that are still in the preclinical science and are getting into the clinical aspect of medicine where you now start getting to the hospitals and you actually start rotating in the hospitals. For those that are already in the hospitals, <laughs> you already know the torture that is there. <laughs> wink, wink. Anyways, um, so here are the five things that I wish I knew before getting myself into the clinical correction. So the first and foremost thing is do not waste your time. Sorry, sorry I keep checking down here because I want to see if my video is actually recording. I've recorded this quite a number of times, more than I'm actually um, proud to admit on camera. So here are the five things that I wish I knew before getting myself into the clinical coaching. The first thing, do not waste your time. That's number one, do not waste your time. What do I mean? We are different types of doctors that you're going to need on the hospital in the ones. So I, I give them nicknames. So you have the first ones, which I refer to as the senders, okay? Sender doctor. Hey, where are the medical students? Oh, I'm, I'm here, ma'am. Um, okay, go get me some the blood work for this patient. Okay. Here, ma'am. Um, can you draw blood for this patient? Okay. Um, can you cannulate this patient? Okay. Um, can you do this for me? They're pretty much sending you the entire single day. Okay, so I think the camera is really recording now. I can continue my video. So they, they pretty much send you the whole day to get stuff for them. And these people don't teach you anything. At the end of the day, you go home with zero information and you're just tired. Then number two, you have the, the silent doctors. These are pretty much the watchful waiting kind of doctors. Hi Doc, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, how are you? I'm okay. They continue writing their notes. And you pretty much, the only words that you ever hear them say is how are you? I'm fine. And you? I'm good. That's pretty much it. If you don't ask them a question, you'll just be watching each other for the entire world round or for the entire session of whatever you're doing, whether it's clinic, whether you're having a core day, whether you're having world rounds. They don't say anything to you. It's like as if you do not exist. These actually won't teach you anything. You won't learn any practical skills from them. You won't learn any theory data from them. And let's say if you're one of those people that learns by observation. I had one rotation mate that was annoyingly like that. That man used to learn just by observation. And I, and I used to wonder, how do you do that? I want that superpower. But anyways, these doctors will barely teach you anything. Then you have pretty much those that I like to call questions galore kind of doctors. So these are pretty much the ones that are just going to be bombarding you with questions. Oh, um, where are the medical students? Okay, come, young man, um, what's, what's this vein called? Young man, uh, what, what is this sign called? Young man, um, what, what is this called on this patient? Have you guys clicked? You guys are, are not reading. You guys are not clicking patients. You need to clerk patients. I don't think you guys are, are being trained well. No, 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 no. This isn't right. You're not studying enough. Mm -mm. No. So yeah, you have those that are pretty much going to be blaming you. Those that are pretty much going to be bombarding you with questions all the time. And, and hey, 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 get, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with someone bombarding you with questions. But if they're just bombarding you with questions and they're not really teaching you, then what exactly are you learning? At the end of the day, you're just going back with a bunch of questions and a bunch of doubts. And anyways, then you have those that are the deflectors, Captain Deflector. 
you pretty much ask them anything medical related, they will deflect it. And they will pretty much find a way to dodge everything that is related to teaching you guys. They will find a way to dodge anything that is related to medicine. Oh, sir, I can ask you a question on this. Ah, uh, so, young man, what do you think? I just asked you the question. What do you mean? What do I think? I don't know. You're the doctor. So they, they pretty much throw back everything to you and give it back to you as an assignment. So those pretty much don't really help so much. Then you have those that um, are pretty much what I like to call the social light. Now these ones are the ones that are pretty much going to be interacting with you and not on medical level, don't get me wrong. <laughs> if you meet one of these people, yo, they talk a lot. So they will be telling you things like, oh, hi, how was your weekend? By the way, I saw you at Capello's yesterday. What were you doing there? Ah, uh, no, doc, uh, I was just uh, hanging out with um, my girlfriend over there. Oh, okay. Ah, we have it. We have a chill out uh, next Sunday. You, you, you guys should come, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I think you enjoy. Pretty much just social information. They're just telling you about your weekend. They're telling you about what they did. They're telling you about their girlfriends. They're telling you about their relationships, of which you don't even want to know. And then. Of course, there's always it's always nice when you're in a tutorial and then the lecturer just simply deviates to tell you about their life story. Big out to big shout out to those lecturers that used to do that during my medical uh, training during my medical school. Now, avoid this kind of doctors. The bracket of doctors that I've pretty much mentioned, avoid them at all costs because they will waste your time and you won't pretty much learn so much from these patients. Actually, from these doctors. Now, the doctors that I want you to follow around are the ones that have a balance of teaching you the practical skills. They are some doctors that just are good with teaching you practical skills. Follow those to get the practical skills that you can learn. How to draw blood, how to cannulate, how to catheterize. They're good at showing you skills. They may not be so good at teaching you the theory, but with skills, they're hands-on. Suturing, hands-on. Then you have doctors that are good at theory. The ones that are, <laughs> call themselves uh, the... Uh, the i'm trying to think of a very smart thing to say right now um the um who's a smart guy in medicine i don't even i don't even know they're trying to think that they are the einsteins of the hospital oh yeah so doc um the pathophysiology of this condition is that uh, such and such a crp and the c-reactive protein come together and they mash up and it's a cytokine storm they give you those big terms and all that but yeah they're very good at explaining things at the end of the day when you actually interact with one of these doctors then you find out that you learn quite a lot of the theory data and you're able to link different things, different pathophysiologies of conditions. Those are really the best doctors to follow around because they will show you everything. Even when you're doing ward rounds, they'll draw you into the process and, and ask you, okay, we've ordered investigations for this patient. What exactly do you think that is wrong with this patient? Look at these investigations and they'll involve you in the process. And that, I think, is a very good thing to do. Don't you think so? I mean... Yeah, I do that to my students, and which is a pretty bad thing. So if you are a doctor and you're watching this, please interact with your students. They are, they are, they're complaining. They're suffering. Students are suffering out there. It, it, med, medicine, medicine is not supposed to be hard to learn, okay? Now, there's this notion that because you're learning medicine in Africa, it should be hard. Because you're learning medicine in, in whatever country, it should be hard. No, that isn't the way. If, because you learned it the hard way, doesn't mean that another person should learn it the hard way. That's the principle that I am trying to instill in every single medical school, in every single lecturer, in every single doctor. And because you guys are the future doctors of the country, so if I instill this in you, then I know that the future is safe. Later on, years in the future, when I send my, my child to medical school, I know that this child is in pretty good hands. Okay, so pretty much don't waste your time, follow the right doctors. The second thing that is there is knowing exactly what to expect. Now, there are a lot of things that you can actually expect in medical school. Number one thing, I mean in, in the clinical collection, number one thing, you will always be tired. And I mean always. If there is one thing that is synonymous with medical students is of course tired. How are you? I'm tired. Can you come to this function? No, I'm tired. I want to sleep. Can you do this? No, I'm tired. Hey, no, I'm tired. That would be one thing that is constant fatigue. Why is there constant fatigue? There is a lot of standing. Trust me, a lot of standing. If you're in surgery, what rounds you're standing? Theater, you're standing. Cold day, you're running up and down. And pretty much, if there's a theater and a cold day, or if there's a theater case on your cold day, that's even worse because you'll be standing for extended periods of time. So there's a lot of standing. 
and um, yeah, because of the standing, it's very easy to actually pass out. P.S. In another episode, I'll talk about my first day of my first clinical rotation that I actually passed out. So I'll save that for an episode later on. If you really enjoy this hospital survival guide, drop a like and drop a comment so that we can make more such episodes where you, you can interact with me on a more face-to-face -face level, not rather behind a PowerPoint presentation that I normally do on the channel or any animation schemes that I do on the channel. Just you and me, face-to-face, -face, right here, right now, it's going on and it's going down. So anyways, <laughs> I know I'm very, very dramatic. Then, um, so I have you lost my train of thought? What, what exactly was I even talking about? Knowing exactly what to expect, yeah. So um, there's a lot of fatigue, there's a lot of tiredness, so you should know your schedule. You should have a functioning schedule. Knowing that if it's 6 a.m., I'm supposed to be at a hospital, wait, but who gets to a hospital at 6 a.m.? Let's say it's, if it's 7 a.m., I'm supposed to be at the hospital and by this time the world run is supposed to be starting which usually is roughly around eight hours or so so between seven to eight find time to actually revise ask your friend what did you study yesterday ask each other questions or ask each other to teach each other topics that's a way that you can maximize on the time such that before you're even tired going home at least you would have covered something for a day because i have a saying and it goes like this a topic a day keeps the sap away so a topic a day keeps the sap away, so please make sure that you cover at least a topic a day. So that's the second thing, knowing what to expect. The third thing is of course having the right people around, having the right seniors, having the right study buddy. I wish I really knew that. Because there were some seniors that were very helpful, big shout out to the seniors that were helpful during my training as a medical student, a big, big shout out to them, they know themselves and I'm really grateful for them. These seniors were constantly helpful, they would help me learn examination techniques, they would help me with the theory data, they would help me with um, uh, organizing tutorials and of course I would even join the seventh year tutorials. Imagine I'm at fifth year and I'm joining the seventh year tutorial. That's how helpful my seventh years were at that time. So if you're a seventh year, please help your juniors. Please help the people that are uh, coming behind you because medicine is about apprenticeship. It's about you leading someone. I am following my senior doctor. Someone is following me. That person is being followed by other people. So the, it's like a chain. And yes, it's, it is a cult if you're asking. Medicine actually is a cult. So you should have that good apprenticeship, a senior that's going to push you, a senior that's going to encourage you, a senior that's going to mentor you, and most of all, and most importantly, a senior that's going to teach you. Of course, do not depend on the senior. Do not become a leech. Also, do your work. Show some enthusiasm. Show that you want to learn. Do not become a pest because there are those medical students that are pests. And you know pests because you think, <laughs> No, you are seniors, you have rotated through this. Wait, you, one day you will also be a senior and you experience what that senior is also experiencing. So also cut the seniors some slack. They are going through a lot. They are also trying to master a lot of things before they can graduate and finally become a doctor. I will do another episode on um, how to survive medical internship because I am uh, currently doing my junior residency. So I will still do uh, videos on that as I go through the medical life and the medical career, which is of course a very, very long career. So please, please don't bother your seniors too much, but find the right seniors, find the right study buddies to be helping you. If you if you are lucky enough to find a doctor that actually mentors you, that's even much, much better. So find someone to mentor you because they will push you even at the hospital, they will push you outside the hospital to study and all that. Of course, keep everything professional as much as you can. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is actually how to learn and how to study during a clinical culture. That's the biggest thing that most students actually suffer from. This is what happens. You, a, a rotation is roughly about eight weeks, yeah? If you're rotating for less than this, then I think you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. If you're rotating for more than this, well and good. It may become monotonous at some, at some point. So if you're rotating for a standard of eight weeks, which I think should be standard for all the schools in the country, eight weeks should be the standard thing for all rotations. Regardless of whatever happens, please rotate for eight weeks. So in the same eight weeks, the first three weeks you're confused, totally confused. You don't know where you're supposed to be. You don't know who you're supposed to be with. You don't know what you're supposed to do. You don't know what you know. You don't even know what you don't know. That's what's confusing about the first um, three weeks. So usually the first three weeks, I usually leave them out. I don't count them as part of the rotation. So effectively you're rotating for five weeks. So what do I do to maximize these eight weeks? In the first three weeks, I make sure I learn the important procedures. What do I mean by learning these important procedures? Who wants to cannulate? 
I'll, I'll do it, Doc. Yeah. Can you just teach me how to do it? Who wants to draw blood? No, I'll do it. Can you just teach me? Who wants to put an energy tube? I'll do it. Can you just teach me? So this that should be the word that should be on your lips. Can you teach me? I don't know. Do not, and I repeat, do not do something that you don't know. Do not do something that you're not comfortable with. Tell the doctor, I'm not comfortable with this. Can you show me? Can you teach me? Because you're dealing with someone's life. It's not like robotic school or mechanics where you can just do a trial and error. If it doesn't work out, oh well, it doesn't work out. Imagine if someone is doing that to your relative. That wouldn't be so nice, yeah? So please make sure that you're confident about what you're doing. Then, um, as you volunteer to learn these basics, in the first three weeks, at least you're also trying to read these topics here and there. It will make a good basis, a good start point. Then another thing that you should also do is know what you're supposed to expect. There's a list of high yield topics that I put out, that I printed back a way, way long time ago, and it's been circulating in many medical schools. If you have no idea what it is, please hit the comment section below. I will send you a link or an email with the high yield list of exactly the topics that are important at fifth year, the topics that are important at sixth year, the topics that are important at final year for you to get through into medical school. Again, if you have, um, no, I have never heard of this high yield list. I don't know who your friends are. I don't know what you have actually been doing, but anyways, these things happen. And then, so know the topics that you're supposed to be doing. And again, remember a topic a day, keeps the sap away so make sure that you cover at least a topic a day you get to the hospital and you will be asked you will see a lot of things the learning at the hospital is rather erratic if this moment you see a patient with diabetes you'll be asked questions on diabetes young man what is diabetes uh, what complicate other complications of diabetes what are the types of insulin which is better for hum for humans which has less reactions of course i insulin or bovine insulin and you're there with your palpitations about to faint hypoglycemic and you have a headache your heart is always racing in the hospital not because you have a cardiac problem but because you're scared they'll ask you something you don't know that's pretty much how the clinical years and the clinical experience is so Regardless of how many topics that you've seen in the day, always make a schedule and you know that you're going to stick to the schedule. At least a topic a day. If you're overdoing it, two topics a day. Think of it like this. There are eight weeks, right? So if we're not counting the first three weeks, we're counting just maybe the last five weeks of the rotation. Five weeks, five multiplied by seven is 35. If you're doing one topic a day, it means you're doing 35 topics in the rotation. 35 topics is enough to cover more than half of the common topics, if not all the common topics. If you're doing two topics a day, that's 70 topics. Remember, you're covering 70 topics. Medicine is a lifelong thing. You, you cannot learn everything. I Even I didn't learn anything during my medical career. I am still learning a lot of things. I am still studying. And yes, I still do study. And you also will be studying probably for the rest of your life because learning never ends. It's like a bottomless fit pit where you just keep falling and falling and falling and falling and Lord Jesus Christ, what did I get myself into? Anyways, so please keep studying, keep going a topic a day. And the fifth and final thing that I wish I knew before getting myself into this medical collection thing is, of course, there will be a lot of heartbreak. There will be a lot of disappointment, especially death. That's the worst thing. You will get to realize people dying right in front of your eyes. The, I've seen people, kids die in front of my eyes. Back when I was in fifth year, my first death hit me really hard. It was this child, we're having this tutorial, then the this child had fallen off a tree, had a head injury, and um, the, the nurse calls us, no, can you start resuscitating this patient? This child is gasping. We get there, we start the, the whole thing, and this child just literally just dies right in front of my eyes. And that's a very, very traumatizing experience if you've never really experienced it before. And as a young, medical students you you are asking yourself what next are we supposed to knock off now i think i'm emotionally traumatized no you don't you continue with your day like nothing has happened imagine continuing with your day like nothing has happened so there will be a lot of death and at, at, as a medical student you're not yet having that responsibility of actually having to talk to the parents and tell them or talk to siblings or the bedsiders to tell them that their, their patient has died. But when you graduate as a doctor, you, you actually have to do this. And this is actually even much worse than actually witnessing the, the person die because you never get used to it. Trust me, you never get used to it. It breaks you every single time. The moment you get used to it is the moment that you should actually stop doing medicine because that's the moment you cease becoming a human. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Hospital Survival Guide. If you did, 
please hit the subscribe button hit the bell notification icon also it really helps and goes a long way hit the like button comment in the section below if you want more of such episodes and uh, thank you also don't forget to follow us on facebook until next time my name is dr moses kazevu also known as dr mk7 until next time bye bye